So I, by way of framing, I just wanted to start and say that I think we understand all of us by now that learning is an action. Learning requires activity. Like learning is an active verb. And so as we think about learning, we think about what is it that learners need to know or to do or to believe to have, to have constituted having learned something. And now as we think about designing learning experiences or learning opportunities for people, a lot of times we're thinking about the kinds of ways that we want someone to practice or do something new, and then also to demonstrate proof of learning. And that's the way that we would assess them as the instructor. And typically when we talk about the kinds of assessments that we're gonna make for learners, we can kind of break them into two broad categories or groups. The first category we often refer to it when we're in the instructional design community as formative assessment. And the idea here is that the assessment that's happening is almost exclusively for the learner's benefit. The learner is practicing, the learner is learning, they're trying to master new skills or understand new concepts. And what we're giving them is opportunity for practice. And when we're doing formative assessment, what's most important for the learner is frequent feedback that's guided and happening just in time. So if we think about formative assessment, you might say, okay, I'm gonna present a new concept or a new idea to you. And then right after you've been exposed to it, I'm gonna give you some opportunity to practice and test your knowledge. And if the experience is designed well, as soon as you've practiced, I'll give you specific directed feedback to help you understand what you, what you learned, what you didn't learn, where you need to practice some more. And then the learner can take that information and practice again or decide where they want to focus their energy and their attention. So that's what we talk about when we talk about formative assessment. The second kind of assessment is, is what we would call summative assessment. And this is where the learner proves in some way that they have learned something. And this is the kind of assessment that most instructors usually think about because it's the end of semester quiz or it's the midterm or it's the assignment that I've given you as the student where you prove to me or you show me what you've learned and I give you a grade or I evaluate you in some way. When we're thinking about like generous or kind instructional design, I think we're thinking about a mixture of both lots of opportunities for formative assessment where we're focusing on the learner and what the learner needs to know and the learner's like, hey, I know I have this quiz coming up or I know I have this paper, but before I do that high stakes assessment, what are the opportunities I have for practice? How can I see how well I'm doing? Do I understand these concepts? And when we're talking about designing effective open educational resources, in most cases, what I'm thinking about is how can we build better formative assessment experiences? How can we give learners more opportunities to practice and let them get a sense for themselves of how well they're doing so they can adjust their energy and their attention as autonomous learners. So as an example, I'm gonna share a screen and show you some of the ways that H5P uh, as a kind of activity category can be used for formative assessment. So here's an example from English literature, which is my background. We've got a poem here where I give a brief, like here's some context that you need to know to understand this poem. Here's the poem itself. And then there's an annotation activity where you'd read through and you'd learn more historical stuff. And, and we've read this poem and I think everybody's read it and they grasped and they understood it. They might've participated in a discussion activity. And then you'll see at the end, this is a post poem quiz. So this is a, a multi-part assessment that helps a learner understand how well did I understand some key concepts. So for example, the first question might be, I might answer and I might guess Jacob early and I'm checking my answer. And right away, you'll see this activity has given me real time feedback. Sorry, this was wrong. You got zero on one point. I could at this point do a lot of things. I could give you a hint. I could show you, oh, actually go back and reread this section about Lincoln's general. Oh, okay, I did it and it says, oh, Samuel Whiteside. Now I've learned something. I'm ready to retry this activity. Now, who was Lincoln's general? Samuel Whiteside. Yes, I got this right. I'm ready to move on. Here's an example of real-time formative assessment happening. Next question. Black Hawk was the leader of the what people? Well, I don't remember reading that. So I come in here and I say, Black Hawk, well, I don't know. I might have to look this up. And then I go and do and I say, okay, I'm ready to answer. He was the leader of the Sock people. Who was the president that was mentioned here? Young Lincoln gives me a hint. So I read about Lincoln and I realize, oh, it was Abraham Lincoln future president, he was a volunteer in the militia. So I'd say, okay, 
That was Abraham Lincoln. And then this poem mentions that Black Hawk was old. And here in the footnote or the annotation, it says he was over 65 years old. So we'll say 65 at the time of the conclusion. And I checked my answer. And again, if I'd got this wrong, I could have seen the answer. I could have retried. And I'm ready to move on and do the next activity. Now, when we're thinking about formative assessment, you can also think, hey, I could chunk this. I could break this up so that I could have you read two lines of the poem and do an assessment and then read two lines more and do another assessment. Or I could have you read a paragraph and do an assessment. Or you could do this multi-part assessment and then read the next chapter of the book and there'd be another formative assessment scattered throughout. So as one way of seeing that as, as another example would be, here's a language example where I listen to a dialogue. Lição 2. Oi, Chico. A Cátia e o Beto estão em casa? So I hear Jorge and Chico discuss this text in Portuguese. And then below, they're going to say, okay, now you need to do this activity where you're marking all of the contractions and definite articles, because we just learned about those. And so I'll practice. I'll go through this activity and I'll get a bunch of these wrong, but I'll try, you know, like I'm marking the words that I think are correct. Oops. And here at the end, I'll say, let's check this activity. This is another example of an H5P activity that's used for formative assessment. Right here, it's showing me I got only two correct and all the rest were wrong. It's clear that I need to study this a lot more. So I can look at the solution and be like, okay, na, ah, no, aus, dos. And I could practice this by redoing this activity until I was satisfied with my response. You could also see that in the chapter before, Throughout this chapter, this very long chapter, they're going to be interspersing learning activities formatively to help you understand. After this section, I'm practicing and I'm going to fill in the blanks here. And I'm going to get all of these wrong, probably. And I'll check and say, wow, I really got those poorly. Let me look at the solutions. Okay. Right. Here's what I need to do to understand this. And I can retry this activity, right? And what's happening is I could check this and say, okay, I got that one right. I'm ready to move on. And then you see we're learning some more things. We're learning prepositions. We're learning some more content. We're learning some more context. And again, at the end of this, there'll be another formative assessment. The reason that H5P is being mentioned here is that H5P is the kind of broad category of tool that we're using to make all of the assessments that you saw so far. There are lots, lots more H5P activity types. If you want to see more examples, there's this great activity source book. In this book that I made, I'm using a bunch of them and I brought a bunch of them in. So to make them in Pressbooks, I would come into my dashboard. I would come into the plugin tool and I would say activate H5P. Once H5P is activated, you'll see it here in the dashboard of my book. And so I can see here's all of the activities I've already created. I could make a new one. And the first time I make an activity, it will bring me to this interface here where you can see something like 40 different content types. These are all interactive types or assessment types. So you saw me do a mark the word activity earlier. I could use that one. I could do a fill in the blank activity. I could make a 360 virtual tour. I could do a multiple choice or so on and so forth. In this case, I'm going to pick a very simple one and I'm going to pick uh, a multiple choice. So I'll start typing multiple choice. And I'll say multiple choice, and I'm going to say use. When I first start creating an H5P activity, it will bring me to a little form that I can fill it out. So I give it a title, which just helps me remember it. So this is going to be practice test. And then you'll start saying, what's the question that I want to ask people? So uh, the question that I want to ask here would be, um, what is the capital of Wisconsin? Because that's where I'm at right now. I happen to know the answer. So then I come into the text and I'm going to start providing what are the choices that would display to users. So in this particular case, I'll say Milwaukee is the first choice. And then I can mark whether it's correct or not. Or I can also give people tips or actual additional formative assessment feedback that if they pick this answer, if they pick this answer, I'll say no. I'm sorry, it's not Milwaukee. It does start with an M though, right? So I could write whatever kind of feedback I want to give. Then I'm going to say the actual answer is Madison. We'll say that's correct. I'll add another plausible distractor here. I'll say, let's say Green Bay. 
And um, I'm going to say that's the thing I want to do for this particular question. H5P also lets me give personalized feedback based on the user's overall score. This isn't going to be super helpful probably for a single multiple choice question, but if I built an assessment that was many, like you saw me do in the Niedeker thing, I might give them a range by saying, okay, you know what, you got over 80%, that's good enough, move on. Or if they scored less than 80%, I might say, it looks like you really want to practice again. I recommend going back and doing this. Or if they scored like under 20%, I might say, wow, uh, your, your success rate is really low. We might want to restudy this section and you may want to come to office hours if you're, having, if you're struggling to grasp this. You can really personalize the message you want to share. You'll also see for most H5P activities a bunch of behavioral settings. The most common one for formative assessment is can a learner retry the activity? You could say, no, nope, sorry, take it once and you're done, or let them retry it. Then I could say, will I show them the solution? So after I finished many of those activities, you saw that I could see the answer. I could turn that setting on or off. I could also say, let's randomize the answers. So let's display them in random order so they don't just know by guessing the right answer. And then I could say, before you can view the answer, you have to at least attempt this question and a number of other settings. And I can set some pass percentage. I can automatically check the answer, et cetera. So there's a bunch of different choices you have here, as well as the ability to customize the language for, your, for the prompt. So you can really get down in deep and you can, I mean, if this question was in French, I could customize the, the prompt and the response language, et cetera. But in this case, we're just making a very basic multiple choice question and we'll create it. So you've seen me make my first H5P activity. What's the capital of Wisconsin? I'm going to pick Milwaukee and check it. And you're going to see here's my formative answer. I'm going to retry it and I'm going to pick Madison and I'll get it, get it right. So I've made an H5P activity. And now at any point in my Pressbook book, I can come in here and I can edit it. And I can say, let's make this activity live in my book. So this new practice test, I'm going to insert it. And now you'll see my multiple choice question about the capital of Wisconsin is now in this book. Two other things that are really helpful are, let's say I went out into the wild and I found a book that I really liked. I could either clone the book or clone the chapter if it's in Pressbooks and all the H5P would come with it. Or I could say, all I want is one H5P activity. So most H5P activities will have a reuse button. And the reuse button will either let you copy the content and just paste it directly into an H5P or download the source file. So I'm going to go ahead and go to a book that has an H5P activity that I already know about. So here's an activity that I like. It's a count to five in Spanish. It wants to use my microphone. So uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. I've successfully recorded my answer. Use my microphone. So uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. All right, so I, I did my activity. I like that activity, but I want to have them, I want the prompt to be do it in French. So I'm going to grab this activity and I'll download it to my, what, my, my, my uh, computer. Now I'll come back into my Pressbooks book. And this time when I go to make the H5P activity, rather than creating a new one, I'm going to select upload. And I will select the file that I want to upload. It will be the one I've just downloaded to my computer. And I'll say use that activity. Because that original activity was openly licensed, I have the permission to revise and adapt it. So I'll say guided recorded French counting. And the prompt will be count to five in French. So now I've created this new activity and it now says count to five in French. Now I can take this new activity and use it anywhere I want. I can put it in any book. The last interesting thing that I wanted to show you is that for every Pressbooks book that we've made, there's also this kind of like a nice tool where you can just add the URL H5P listing to the end of the address and it will show you a list of all of the different H5P activities that are in the book. In this particular book, there are, in this Portuguese book, there's over a hundred. So I could show them all and I could just see them one by one. This is going to take a while for my browser, but I could, oh, I like that one. Let's reuse it. Or I could just look at them one at a time. And it will give me some information about what kind of activity it is, what its title was. So it's a nice way to find H5P activities and books that you know of in one place. And that's the kind of very beginning intro guide that I wanted to share in the short amount of time that we have.
about how you can build formative assessments in an OER and use them wherever you want with Pressbooks and H5P. All right, so the question that I heard was, um, what's the relationship between H5P and Pressbooks? Can you just use H5P and Pressbooks? So the answer is, H5P is the tool maker for all of those interactive content types. They're made by a company from Norway called Jubel, and it is open source software. So there are many ways that people can use H5P. They can use it through H5P themselves. They can use it directly in Moodle or WordPress or Drupal. Um, or they can use it from h5p.com, which is the uh, way that you pay h5p to use it as a premium service. What we did is we use h5p's open source WordPress plugin in Pressbooks so that you're creating the h5p activities directly in your Pressbooks book and they live there in your book database with your book. Um, that's something that we've integrated with Pressbooks. And the way that we've integrated it is done so that when you make activities, they live with a book. When you insert them in a book, they display in the book, in the web book. And then when you clone an existing Pressbooks book or, or uh, copy it from one network to another, the H5P activities will come with it as part of our cloning routine. So you would have a copy of the source activity that's editable in the child book that can be revised all automatically. Um, so that's a little bit about the relationship between Pressbooks and H5P. We're open source software, they're open source software, and we built an integration for their product into Pressbooks. So the, the other really exciting piece related to H5P that I think all of us in the open community are really thrilled about is H5P has been working on making a, essentially a global repository for H5, openly licensed H5P activities. They're calling it the H5P OER hub. And right now that you can go to this website, h5p.org, backslash OER dash hub dash coming to see a progress report. I believe that they were planning to unveil this at their con global conference that was going to be in Madison, Wisconsin in May. That's been postponed or changed because of the global pandemic, but you can see what's coming and learn a little bit more about this. The idea would be you'd be able to, bra you'd be able to search, not just create content and upload like I showed you in my demo, but you'd be able to say get shared content and you'd be able to find already openly licensed content openly licensed content on a variety of topics in a variety of ways and use it anywhere that you can use h5p um, and i didn't show you the metadata tool but there's a way that you can openly license your content and include it in the hub i think which is coming in the future and then they give you in big detail all the different components of it and where they're at for their for the progress um, I think that's going to be very exciting. It'll make it very easy for people to find and use and reuse um, open assessments. And it should really advance the ability that all of us have to make courseware better, faster with H5P.